This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Get a whole month free at mubi.com slash speakingmymovies. This is one of my favorite scenes from Bong Joon-ho's 2003 crime thriller, Memories of Murder. Here we have three characters, Tuman, Taehyun, and Hyungyu. Tuman and Taehyun are detectives who've been desperately trying to catch an unknown serial killer, and Hyungyu is their prime suspect. Sadly for them, it has just been confirmed that Hyungyu's DNA does not match that of the killers, and therefore he is innocent. It's possibly one of the most critical scenes of the film, and Bong Joon-ho decides to play it out with just the visuals. Notice how the two characters are placed at the entrance of a tunnel that divides them into two contrasting areas of light and darkness. If you look closely, you can even see that the detective is getting wet by the rain outside the tunnel while the suspect isn't because he's standing inside. What's fascinating about this visual division is that it perfectly captures and communicates the character's unavoidable positions, making it difficult to side with either one of them. Look how similar yet different the two are in this scene. Although Duman is outside in light, his face is shadowed by the darkness of the tunnel. And conversely, Hyungyu's face is brightly lit by the daylight despite being in the darkness. It's a wonderful visual representation of their relationship. That although both Duman and Hyungyu are in the same spot, face to face as human beings, they are ultimately on the opposite ends of a spectrum. Each time the camera alternates between the two, their positional distance only grows bigger, until a train comes and forces them apart. No matter how desperate the detectives are, they cannot bring Hyungyu in. This is why the train also rips the evidence document in half. It visualizes the train wreck of a journey the detectives were on, irresponsibly wielding their power in the name of justice. It's the consequence of carrying out their urges without regard for others. The clash between evidence and intuition, hope and despair. The scene fittingly ends with Hyungyu walking into the darkness, with the detectives watching him disappear forever. Like this, I think truly great films have the ability to convey their quality without discrimination, their excellence intrinsically felt by all viewers. This is why Bong Joon-ho's stories are full of visual associations. For instance, take a look at how the film introduces and develops its main characters, Duman, Taeyun, and Yonggu. Since Duman is presented in the film as a man of instinct who trusts his perception, he is mostly shot straight on with his entire face visible, and is usually placed closest to the camera with the emphasis on his looks. Taeyun, on the other hand, is an outsider cop who holds opposing values to Tuman. Therefore, he is frequently placed away from the camera and out of focus as a means to express his alien status, and is only given the spotlight when the situation requires logic or solid evidence. Finally, there is Yonggu, the most primitive detective out of the three. Since he routinely assaults his suspects and justifies his actions as being righteous, the film center frames him in moments of violence to highlight his aggressiveness, while also having him only kick with his right leg. However, because the film's most interesting conflicts arise from Tuman and Taeyun's opposing energy, Yonggu isn't coupled with a particular camera positioning. Instead, Yonggu himself repeatedly enters and leaves the frame in a disorderly but carefully choreographed manner. This keeps the tension created by the two detectives intact while also detailing Yonggu's impulsivity to the audience. Like I said, visual storytelling. But in stories, things that are omitted can be just as important as things that are included. And this applies to visual storytelling as well. In fact, this is one of Bong Joon-ho's strongest assets, his ability and tendency to de-emphasize important visual details. Now, take a look at the following scenes and see if you can find a hidden visual pattern. Do you see it? Every scene I've just shown you has the color red, green, and blue. As a matter of fact, nearly every scene of the film features at least one of the three colors as an accent. The reds, the greens, the blues, the red and blue, the red and green, the green and blue, and all three at the same time. Even in the film's most infamous long take scene, we see red and green everywhere. Okay, but 
If the colors are highlighted in so many shots, why is it so hard to register their presence? Simply put, it's because the film actively steers your attention away from its color scheme by keeping the scenes desaturated and flat. If you re-examine the scenes with this in mind, you will realize just how dull and gray everything looks, especially compared to the film's opening and closing shots. And because these are the only two sequences in the film that are fully saturated, this visual contrast increases the likelihood of the audience forgetting the weight of the colors in other scenes. But why? Why would Bong Joon-ho go through the effort of creating a visual pattern only to hide it at the end? The answer is quite simple. Elements that are hidden in plain sight are capable of influencing the viewers without becoming a visual distraction. And colors are the perfect tool for this. Let's take the mentioned opening sequence as an example. A shot of children cheerfully playing by a tranquil paddy field, followed by Tuman arriving on a tractor and discovering a dead body of a young woman under the gutter. This opening sequence is a direct visual translation of the film's central motif, the coexistence of harmony and chaos. It's an idea that summarizes the tragic atmosphere of the 80s Korean society the film is based on, a message that must be established before the story takes off. The conflicting images of the dead body and the peaceful paddy field may be sufficient in delivering this concept, but what hammers the message home is the yellow tint that fills up the screen. First off, it gives the setting a false sense of security and innocence with its warm, bright tone. This makes the discovery of the body that much more shocking and out of place. Secondly, it adds a touch of insanity and obsessiveness to the picture by keeping everything overly monochromatic, and therefore, unreal. Again, influence without distraction. This is also why the detectives are mostly found wearing clothes that match the colors of the walls behind them, blending into the background. They are the desaturated tone that commands the shot, the faded palette that symbolizes the world governed by authority, damaged by their brutality. They are indistinguishable from the bleak world that surrounds them because they are part of the problem. The same problem that obscures the reds, the blues, and the greens with its discolored murk. And their coercive behavior extends to the viewers. The color red is given a narrative link with the victims to the audience by the police. This compels the audience to anticipate the appearance of the color red when the victims are being shown on screen. But that also means that the audience is likely to brush the color off as irrelevant when the victims are off screen. That is, the majority of the film. And better yet, this premise turns out to be false, both narratively and cinematically. As you can see, this middle school student isn't in red, neither is this woman, and even those who are known to have been in red don't necessarily appear that way on screen. You see, the real color of the victims in this film is white. You can even tell which suspects are innocent by looking at their clothes. Here's the first suspect they try to frame, and here's the second. There's a bunch of kids in their taekwondo uniform, middle school students in their activewear, and the guy playing one of the victims during the first murder reenactment, all in white. Proving this point, the one suspect who is not in white is Hyungyu. His clothes blend into the background just like the detectives, because his liability must remain uncertain until the film's finale. By this point, you may have realized that the colors are not meant to be paired with a single connotation. However, that doesn't mean we can't speculate, so let's give it a try. There's one particular scene near the beginning of the film where the red, green, and blue are used as a defining color rather than a simple accent. This is the scene. We see a red cloth wrapped around the scarecrow, the green field, and the fogged up blue sky, all slightly muted by a touch of desaturation. Now, think about what each area represents in the film. The field covered in grass is where the real killer tends to hide, chase, and eventually catch the victims. It's also the place where the detectives frame their suspects, discover the victims' bodies, and patrol to catch the killer. Green, therefore, can be interpreted as the color of the suspect, mystery, and blame. This explains why the main interrogation room has a green door, why the bulletin board and the document folders that contain the list of suspects are in green, why Kwang Ho, who is falsely accused, suddenly shows up with a tracksuit with green highlights over his white shirt, 
and why Hyungyu is surrounded by green the first time the detectives visit him. Then there is the blue of the sky, overlooking everything on the ground. Blue represents the neutral observers, the bystanding people of the town. The surgeon, the workers, the delivery man, the friend, the blue collar shirt of Kwang Ho after he is released, and of course, Hyungyu, whose blue stance got engulfed by the green trap of the detectives. It is the joyless color of the society that forcefully revolves around the horrific killings. Lastly, there is the much debated red. Written on the scarecrow is a message that echoes the hardship of the townspeople. Turn yourself in, or may your rod and die. In short, red signifies the primitive drive that impairs proper judgment. The threat, the fabrication, the trauma, the recordings, and even adrenaline. The red results in nothing but physical and emotional death of the innocents, whether it be from the killer or from the authorities. Where there is a tragedy, there is a spectator. And where there is a spectator, there is a suspect. The coinciding colors are no different from the opening scene as just another face of the coexisting harmony and chaos. In this sense, perhaps the colors are hidden in plain sight, less as a device of natural influence and more as a symbol for sorrow. In this gray world run by the governmental authorities that blind the truth and fail to protect, Pung Jun ho may have painted a speck of vividness in hopes that the truth be discovered and the people be consoled. The original Korean title of Memories of Murder is Sarine Cho, or in English, Nostalgia of a Murder, as the opening forms a loop with the ending, reminding us of where it all began. We ponder the title once again, realizing that murder can never be nostalgic, especially to those who were involved. With this painful realization, Duman reminisces about the inept circumstances of the past for the audience. It's only in retrospect that we see the inadequacies and absurdities of our living conditions. But that's also where the joy of the ordinary and hope for the future remains. That despite all the flaws, there were always moments of normalcy that can be appreciated. Coexistence of harmony and chaos. That's what makes nostalgia and this tale about life bittersweet. Thank you everyone for watching my video on this amazing film by Pong Juno, a film that offers so much more than a great story, giving an in-depth look of how poverty, trauma, and sociopolitical atmosphere can shape a society and presenting them in an easily digestible cinematic format. I highly recommend you give this one a watch if you haven't already, and if you happen to be in Canada like I am, you can actually watch this film today on MUBI the sponsor of this video. Movie is an online curated cinema streaming service that premieres a new film every day. And since every film is handpicked, it's a great way to watch films you love and discover new films you haven't seen before. Like I said, if you're in Canada, you can find and watch Memories of Murder as well as tons of other great films that are similar in tone, like Hirokazu Koreada's 2018 work, Shoplifters. In fact, you can get an extended 30-day free trial today if you head over to movie.com slash speakingaboutmovies. That's M ubi.com slash speakima movies. So go check it out and thanks again for watching.